Hello and thanks for joining us for this webinar for health professionals, women's health across cultures, enhancing your approach. I'm Fiona Darling and I work at Jean Hales Health in the, in the Translation Education and Communication Unit. And this is our second webinar for our 2017 series. Firstly, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land we're presenting on and we're reaching tonight and pay our respects to elders both past and present and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are joining us this evening. And we are reaching lands across Australia with registrations from all over the country and from a wonderfully diverse group of health professionals. A special welcome to any of you who are joining us for the first time. Jean Hales for Women's Health is a national not-for-profit organisation working to improve the knowledge of women's health. We do this by combining research, clinical care and education for women and health professionals. Our approach to health and well-being acknowledges that women are not simply the sum total of their illnesses, but of their wellness, their life experiences, their experience, expectations and culture. With the 2016 census data showing the ever-growing diversity of Australia, discussions on providing health care that understands what it is to practice in a culturally sensitive and respectful way and how these principles can best be embedded with organisations are as important as they've always been. Culture encompasses much more than ethnicity or race, language or religion, and tonight we'll look at understanding culture as a broader construct and how deepening this understanding and reflecting on our own values and assumptions can positively impact and influence our delivery of healthcare that is culturally, culturally safe and culturally congruent. We want the discussions to be relevant across cultures and while we don't have time to go into the nuances of specific cultures such as Australian Indigenous cultures, we hope that the content can be broadly applied. Therefore, the learning objectives tonight are to reflect on definitions of culture, explain what is meant by cultural safety and how it relates to cultural awareness and cultural competence. Look at how we can create cultural safety across organisations and how health literacy and communication impact on the provision of care to women from multicultural and multi-faith backgrounds. A little housekeeping though first, for those tuning in live, if you experience any technical difficulties, there's the support number on the bottom left of your screen. You can ask our panel questions by using the tab on the bottom right of your screen and we'll try to get to as many as we can and thank you to those who have already sent in some questions, there have been some great ones. We're also covering the Twitter live, the feed, the webinar live on Twitter, um, so if you're into tweeting please join us with the hashtag JHWHLive. Hopefully you've had a chance to have a read and think about some of the pre-webinar activities that we sent you. You would have got them when you registered or in your reminder email this morning. If not, you'll find those and a whole lot of other useful resources, including the case studies that we'll be discussing tonight in the resource library tab. So I'd encourage you to go and have a look at that folder. Once the webinar closes, these resources won't be available anymore, so they'll be available again on the Jean House website when the recorded version goes up sometime next week, um, but we'll let you know when, the, when that's available for you. <clears throat> if you do want to wish uh, receive uh, CPD points uh, for viewing the webinar, you need to complete the evaluation questionnaire and that's available on your player screen as well. Um, now that that's all over, I'd really like to introduce tonight's panellists. They all have so much experience and we're very lucky to have them with us tonight. Unfortunately, in the interest of keeping to time, I can't read to you all about um, their, their backgrounds and where they're working from, but their bios are available in that resource tab. Um, we have Monique Hamid, who's the National Training Officer for Multicultural Centre for Women's Health. Ruth D'Souza, who works at the Centre for Cultural Ethnicity, Ethnicity and Health, and she's a researcher and stream leader there in policy and evaluation. We have Natalia Nesvadba from Mercy Health in Victoria, and she's the manager of multicultural services there. So good evening to you all, and thank you for joining us. I thought just before we get started that we'd do a poll um, of our audiences just to see um, how confident they feel in their cross-cultural practice. So you should have a pop-up window now appearing on your screen. If you can click that response now as to how confident you feel that you're providing care to your patients currently that considers their culture, beliefs and level of health literacy. Um, we have the options of very confident, somewhat confident and not at all confident. 
So if you're able to make your selections, we'll see where everybody's sitting at the beginning of this webinar. And I'm not sure if I can get the, uh, the results. So we might just, we might come back to that and see if we can get the results later on. So um, I'd like to start by introducing Monique Hamid. She's, as I said, from the Multicultural Centre for Women's Health and she's going to be talking about understanding culture. Thanks, Fiona. Um, so before I start, I just wanted to pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, which is where we're meeting today, um, and also to the tra uh, traditional custodians around Australia, wherever you may be tuning in from. Um, I'm going to do my section on understanding culture. So I'd like to talk about how we use this term culture. Um, consider some of the cultures that we ourselves consider ourselves a part of. Um, and how these might function not just on the interpersonal level but also on the organisational and structural level and then talk about this idea of cultural competency um, or cultural competence and some of the limitations of this approach. Um, so to begin, I've just included um, an activity that we do as part of our training at MCWH and it's, we ask people um, to think about what these images mean to them. So what do you think of when you see these pictures? We, when we run the activity, people will often say things like um, it's very colourful. They think of religion, dress, tradition, dance, ritual, celebration. Um, the word authentic often comes up. Um, and they often talk about how it's mainly <coughs> black or brown people that we see in the images. And some people even say it makes them think of travel or a travel brochure. Um, and what we, we then ask is, what do all these pictures have in common? And there's three main themes that come up. One is that they're all very visible forms of culture to the viewer. Um, most include pictures of people. So this idea that culture is something that resides in the individual. Um, and the idea of travel. So what does this say about where we find culture? So the idea of travel as an experience, but not necessarily something that you yourself have. And then we ask people to think about what's missing from these pictures. People will often note that there's not a lot of white people in the photos. Um, they note that there's not technology um, or they often use the word modern. So it's interesting to think about that idea of modern and traditional and how we relate that to culture. Um, depictions of Western culture, however you might interpret that, and more invisible forms of culture. We ask the group, usually um, majority Anglo health workers, if they feel like they have culture. And often we get mixed responses. Some say no, some say yes, but not as much as others. Um, and some say that they feel like it's not as, often, um, as obvious or it's more hidden. So it's a common idea that I think is worth exploring when we talk about culture. Um, what I'd like to propose is that when you're from a more dominant culture and it's represented all around you, it can feel like it's almost more invisible to you. Um, and this can play out not on just a personal level, but also through the organisations that you might be a part of and that represent you and the policies that govern you. An example of this might be the Western biomedical tradition. Um, so the organisations <coughs> that make that up, do they have a culture? I think that's something that we might want to think about today. I would argue that they would. Um, so despite our idea of culture being quite specific, um, this activity helps give us a more broad definition of what culture might be that it's not just something that non-white people have, that it can be both traditional and modern, um, that it's fluid and constantly changing, and that it plays out not just on the interpersonal level between people, but also on an organisational and structural level. I've got an image here of an iceberg. Um, it's a metaphor that's sometimes used to help understand culture. It has its limitations, um, but I think it can be useful in talking about the visible and invisible aspects of culture. So the iceberg's tip, which shows above the water, can be thought of as the easily identifiable characteristics of culture, so the things that might be visible to you. Um, and when we talk about a tick box approach to cultural competency, it's often these things that get focused um, on. So things like language, ethnicity, um, traditional practices. Um, but of course, there's a whole lot of invisible um, aspects of culture that might not be so obvious to you um, at first look, but they often make up quite a large part of culture. Um, so all of these, these interact um, with each other. So again, this metaphor of the iceberg, you can see that they're connected. There's external factors. Um, and what is the tip and what's the base will change depending on the external environment. 
So um, to bring it back to your practice, I often hear services talk about cultural barriers that immigrant and refugee women face. Um, they often focus on the top part, so the language difficulties. Um, what you miss when you talk about that is you miss talking about some of the structural issues. So um, navigating the Australian health system, visa entitlements, access to health information, migration and settlement process, um, discrimination and racism. These are all things um, that we need to talk about when we talk about culture, but they're often things that get left out of the discussion. In terms of who has culture, I want us to start thinking about um, the concept of us all having culture. Um, it's not just non-white people, it's everyone. Uh, it affects how people think and act, but it doesn't produce a uniformity of thought or behaviour, and it's linked to power and privilege. So just some statistics, 28.2% um, of the estimated resident population was born overseas. Uh, there are more than 300 different languages that are spoken in Australian households. 49% of people were born overseas or have had one parent born overseas and more than 20% of people speak a language other than English at home. So when we're talking about people who might be culturally and linguistically diverse, it's actually quite a big group of people that we're talking about and I think that's really important to remember um, when we do this work. Um, we might use different words to refer to this group of people. So throughout this, we might use different words like CALD, culturally and linguistically diverse, refugee and immigrant, non-English speaking background. We might refer to race or ethnicity. Um, all of these terms have their own politics and all of them will be used in different settings. As health workers, you might prefer one over the other or you might be required to use one or the other. Um, but I think what's important to remember is that there are different politics that come with each term and that each of these terms have as much diversity within them as between them. So um, despite two people um, identifying as Asian or being identified as Asian, there could be so many things about their identity, um, including their age, their education, their migration history, their language, their religion, their class background, that might affect how they might identify in any one moment and what their support needs would be. Um, as well, another note on language, we might be using terms like patient, client, service provider. Um, and again, the language will depend on what setting we're talking about and who we are and our experiences. Um, so this idea of cultural competency, just to end. So cultural competency um, is a discourse that arose in the 1990s. Um, and it came out of really good intentions. So it was this idea that um, cultural and linguistic barriers might interfere with effective delivery of health services. Um, and it was also responding to health disparities between mainstream populations and migrant and refugee populations. Um, so the intentions were to make services more accessible and they did this mainly through training um, practitioners to be aware of particular health beliefs that might be in conflict with biomedical models. Um, there was a strong focus on understanding the other, building awareness around different cultural beliefs, um, and there was a belief that certain characteristics of different migrant groups could be identified, studied and managed. Um, so there's been quite a critique of this approach in the last couple of years, an acknowledgement that it's impossible to be familiar with all cultural perspectives, um, and that viewing clients as members of a discrete cultural groups rather than individuals with unique personal experiences and expectations can lead to stereotyping and assumption making. So like the point I was making before, there's often as much diversity within as between. Um, so why might we want to move <coughs> beyond it? There's been a shift in thinking and we'll hear about some different approaches tonight. Um, but moving from this paradigm of learning about the other with the idea that it's impossible to learn every single culture out there um, to learning about ourselves. So cultural competency programs often reduce culture to just the race or ethnicity of the other and don't consider culture in a broader sense. You're often looking at the individual rather than the organisational and the structural. Um, it also doesn't help us talk about privilege and power and I'm hoping that we can talk about that more tonight. Um, but some of those things I was mentioning, mentioning the barriers such as the immigration system, um, visa categories, racism and discrimination, that sort of thing. Um, so focusing less on the individual and, and, um, con or connecting more the individual to the larger structural issues. So to conclude my points, 
Um, culture is not just a word that we'd use to describe something that non-Anglo individuals have. We all have complex multiple identities. Um, no one can be competent in someone else's culture. Um, even the cultures that I consider myself to be a part of, I wouldn't say that I would then be able to, you know, um, achieve 100% competency in, in those. Um, and culture is linked to power and privilege. So I think to do this work, it's, it's really important that we begin to reflect on our own position. Um, and this is crucial to providing culturally appropriate care. Thank you so much, Monique. How lucky are we? Like such a beautiful introduction to tonight's webinar. And um, so many fabulous be beginning points for us that we'll delve into tonight about diversity and diversity and that the, the structural issues particularly, we'll hope that we'll get into some of those later on. So thank you for that. That was really great. Um, I'd now really like to introduce Dr. Ruth D'Souza, um, independent researcher and um, stream leader at the Centre for, Cent Centre for Culture, Ethnicity and Health here in Victoria to talk to us more about cultural safety and how that's different. Thanks Fiona and uh, terrific to be here and thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we know that it's an evening and people are busy so good on you all who are watching. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, that this is a really special week, it's NAIDOC week, where um, we're encouraged to think about the centrality and importance of language uh, to people from the, um, who are Aboriginal and from the Torres Strait. Um, I also want you to pay special uh, attention to my lipstick. You'll notice um, that both my hair and my lipstick are matching the Jean Hales um, brand. So, um, you know, I did, I did my best here. <coughs> So, uh, Monique, thank you very much for um, that really great introduction to culture, and I'm going to be building a bit upon it. I've also got a bit of a cough, so you'll hear me um, coughing occasionally <laughs> and drinking water. And see, just talking about a cough made Monique cough, so it's quite contagious. Um, so what I'm going to do is give you a bit of an overview about cultural safety and um, talk about why it might be a useful framework for your work. First of all, I want to talk about the idea of marginalisation. So Monique was talking about um, how we all have culture and how we have multiple identities. And I think this is a really important thing that I want you to just take a minute to reflect on. So who are you in terms of um, your ethnicity? Who are you in terms of your gender, your class position? your gender identity, your gender expression, uh, all those kind of interrelated ways in which we can think about culture. There are some aspects that um, we don't get to express during a working day, whether, you know, for example, being a parent might always be there in the back of your mind, but there's a culture of parenting that we're immersed in. Um, so um, the thing about cultural safety that I think is very important is that um, like Monique said, we all have culture, um, but we are interpolated or we are positioned differently um, depending on the context. So for example, uh, I might be privileged because I'm someone who's university educated. I'm used to talking a lot and being listened to by people. I'm a health professional. So in many of those settings, I hold a lot of power, but I'm also a woman of color. Um, and so in some situations, I might experience marginalization and oppression. So if we think about health, um, I think one of the things that I've learned to um, fight against is the idea that it's purely a micro level biomedical or individual aspect, you know. So, so to some degree, of course, we make choices, choices. Um, about what we do and how we live that have an impact on our health. But also um, there's particular social and structural determinants that Monique has already alluded to that have an impact on our health. And you can see that in the cartoon um, or, the, or the picture that we've got uh, on the slide. So we already know, and especially in the context of NAIDOC week, um, but the kind of global humanitarian crisis that we've been experiencing the last few years is that um, there are some groups that are impacted very differentially um, by historical, structural and social inequities that mean that um, 
health is a more difficult thing to attain or acquire or to maintain. So one of the things that's becoming more evident is that there are particular conditions that lead people to be marginalised. So while we might all have culture, uh, in some settings having a particular culture means that we can access a lot of services and support and in other contexts we might not. So cultural safety or kaka, kawa whakaruruhau um, is a concept that I've kind of been immersed in as someone who's a registered nurse in New Zealand. Um, and for me, it's been very, very useful um, as, a, as a way of understanding um, how we might negotiate uh, differences in health or relationships in health. Um, and how it came about was from Indigenous nurses, so I'm very, very grateful to them. And what they talk about is it's not just um, a process, but it's an outcome. And what it attempts to do is to address... Uh, power relations. So it's not just focused at the individual level, like, you know, am I being racist to somebody else? But what are the kind of cultures of the institutions in which we work? And Monique's already talked about that, that sometimes we forget that health has a culture. It's got a language, it's got jargon, and all those things might um, create exclusions for people. Um, but the other thing that I think is very important is it makes an assumption that um, history has an impact on the present. You know, history isn't just something that's happened, but it's also something that's happening now. It's been part of the curriculum in New Zealand for a long time, since 1991, and now it's being used in Canada and Australia. So I'm going to leave that on very, very quickly because you can go and have a read of it later. But some clear things that are important are the nurse or the doctor, or the podiatrist, or the paramedic, whoever you are that's a, a giver of health care, a provider of health care, um, we have a history and we bear culture that has an impact on other people and also shape how we respond to other people. We're asked in, in, in thinking about cul cultural safety to think about our practice and recognise that there is a power imbalance that's very much biased towards the provider of the service. And we've got to balance that and think about that and find ways to resolve that tension and negotiate that tension so that we can provide equitable health care. So it makes a couple of assumptions, and I'm going to wrap up in a minute and pass on to Natalia. But basically it assumes that every encounter is bicultural. So not only do we need to understand our own social conditioning, we also need to understand the historical and contemporary context of the health system. And instead of viewing the person that doesn't fit into the system, you know, cultural barriers Monique talked about, um, we start to see culture and the culture of healthcare as a site for transformation. And cultural safety asks us to think about our own cultural self. What are our values and beliefs about healthcare? And we're going to be talking about that and exploring that in our case study. <coughs> Step one, very quickly, is we understand there's a difference between ourselves and somebody else. And what we do is, uh, it might be at a very, very superficial level, but we recognise some of the rituals and practices. It might be those things that Monique talked about, which are those very, very visible aspects of the iceberg. But we might not see the emotional, social, economic and political, or the things that are under the iceberg. The next step is cultural sensitivity, where we legitimate that difference and we say, oh my goodness, what, what do I need to do to work with this person in a way that's safe and appropriate? But my favourite part is the third part. Um, cultural safety is actually when we flip the switch completely, we reverse the gaze and we say, actually, it's not about me looking at that other person, it's me looking at myself and the person that I'm caring for saying, they felt safe. So the power shifts to the consumer or the recipient of the service who feels recognized, respected. They feel like their rights have been maintained. And we've avoided diminishing, demeaning, or disempowering them. On that note, I'm now going to hand on to Natalia. Thanks so much, Ruth. <clears throat> I think that was a really good 
delving into the topic a little bit more and I'm looking forward to having more of those discussions when we get through the case studies, um, particularly around, you know, health as having its own culture and a site for transformation. Thank you. Natalia. Thanks, Fiona. And I'd like to join all my colleagues in acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands we are meeting on. I'll start taking us a little bit more into the day-to-day -day issues and look into cross-cultural communication. And, you know, I'm sure you are all aware about the link between communication and how critical that is in any healthcare <coughs> encounter. And there are also numerous studies that talk about the links between, you know, non-English speaking people when they found themselves in, you know, Anglo-based systems, that they are at a higher risk of experiencing adverse outcomes. And in all of that, you know, what Monique and Ruth have spoke about is how do we ensure that our systems and our processes are culturally safe? Well, I believe that firstly, we need to try and understand who accesses our service. So here I just have a snapshot from our public hospitals in Victoria. And every year we produce a demographic profile of the patients that have accessed our services. And this is just a snapshot. We obviously go down into specific details about how many we have from all of these in all of these categories. But one thing that's really obvious here is you can see for the last three years how significantly bigger diversity of our patient population is. So I like to challenge everyone and say, this just needs to be our core business. It's no longer an add-on and something different we need to think about. We actually need to live and breathe this every day. We see people in our services. So, in all of that, when we think about communicating cross-culturally, often people talk about, you know, oh, I'll just get an interpreter or someone who speaks that language and, you know, we're fine. Well, we are not, because that's only one element of actually appropriately communicating to a person that may not speak language or that even may speak English, someone such as me who has actually learned English as an adult, but, you know, still sometimes grapple with some Anglo concepts that are very different to where I've come from. So what we talk about is these three key elements. So health literacy, cultural competence and safety. So all those three stages that Ruth mentioned and language services. And how does that fit in the per person-centered care concept? So I'll just briefly outline some of the key areas there. And obviously in our case studies, we will have a chance to explore those more. So what is health literacy? Concept that's really gaining traction in the last few years. So there's so many definitions you will find out there. But again, at Mercy, we have decided to look at this definition that talks about firstly, a patient's or a person's ability to obtain, understand and act on health information to make informed choices. But it is also a provider's capacity to communicate clearly, to educate about health, and to empower their patients. And, you know, Ruth just talked about us considering each encounter as a bicultural encounter, and that really sits nicely in here because immediately in this definition, we see that there's the patient and there's us, and how do those two interact? Why is health literacy important? Well, we know in Australia that 59% of adults, and this is all adults, this is not just migrants, that they are functionally health illiterate. That means that they are not able to make informed decisions. And for all of you health professionals out there, if you think about informed consent, my question always is, how informed was that consent actually? The research also tells us that individuals that are most affected in terms of being healthy literate are people who have had limited experience interacting with our healthcare system, the way it is set up here, older individuals, disadvantaged populations, and also culturally and linguistically diverse communities. Cultural competence or safety, I'm not going to talk about too much, but in terms of what we do, again, we start with that premise of, you know, who are you as a health provider? What makes you you? And what's going to trigger a 
potentially different response to how you would treat maybe someone who's very similar to you. Before we move to the next stage, we'd actually like to do a poll. So again, there will be a question there on your screens. And the question is, do you know how to access interpreting services in the organization where you work? I don't know if we're going to get that yeah, feed. Yeah, I think or... we should have, um, there should be yes or no popping up. And we do have the answers now from our first poll. Um, we, so I might just revisit those ones while uh, I wait for these, this second poll to come up. So we asked, how confident do you feel that you're providing care to your patients that considers what we're talking about tonight? And uh, three quarters of you, 75% said somewhat confident. So we've got a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of you to see if we can boost you up to more confident. 10% uh, said very confident, which is great. We want to see more of those. Um, and 15% saying not at all confident. So we're glad that you're tuning in tonight. So, um, and we hope that you'll have lots to be, that you'll be able to take away with you um, that will help you when you get back to your work tomorrow or, um, you know, next week because this is what this is all about. Um, so I'll just see. If not, we'll just continue. If not, we'll come <laughs> back to that one too. So we're talking about language services, which... You know, in Australia, if we think about Australian Charter of Healthcare Rights talks about the, you know, consumers that access healthcare services, that they have a right to access a professional interpreter. Yet time and time again, we see situations where, you know, family members and friends are used to assist with communication, will grab, you know, a, a colleague or a cleaner or anyone who happens to speak that language. Unfortunately, you know, things are improving slowly and we can still do much more. But it is really critical for any healthcare provider to identify what is the preferred language of a person that they are seeing. And the reason I say this is that, as I mentioned, even for someone like me, I was actually in a very weird situation when I was in labor with my first child that I actually could not utter a word of English. I could only speak in my first language. And as bizarre as that sounds, it was even a surprise to me. Mm -hmm. So we need to think that there are situations when people are not well, when people are, you know, experiencing trauma, pain, all of those situations that, you know, impact on our ability to communicate in a language that may be a second, third or, you know, fourth language for some of us. So it is really critical to understand what is the preferred language. And, you know, we don't have our poll results, but how do you access a professional interpreter and not rely on family members? I'm sure that amongst you, you have a lot of stories where you've tried to communicate information through the family members. You know, cancer is one of those clear things where we know family members will not interpret a diagnosis of cancer. I will just briefly mention that, you know, for each service, this will be different for us in primary health care or, you know, acute health. These are some of the critical points in care where we say interpreters must be provided because, again, that issue of, you know, how do you obtain good quality information from a patient? How do you assess them? How do you consent them? How do you discharge them home, especially if they need to self-manage once they go? And just quickly, and this is my last point, few important points around working effectively with an interpreter. I have seen it time and time again where this first point of briefing the interpreter actually does not happen. We bring an interpreter into a room at the same time when we bring a patient in. We expect an interpreter to be a walking dictionary. If we actually spend 30 seconds before that to tell the interpreter, this is the case we are seeing today, set some ground rules around, if I'm not making sense, please tell me and I will repeat or I will explain or I will simplify. You know, don't try and imagine things yourself and explain them. This will make that encounter much more time effective and the quality of it will be improved. So I'm not going to go in the interest of time through all of those specific points. But the second last point, they talks about teach back at the end of consultation. And the question is, how do you know, even in English, how do you know that the patient has understood what you have just said to them? 
And how do you ensure that when they leave your room, that they know what they need to do and how they're going to manage their condition, how they're going to go and attend that test and, and various kinds of things. Health literacy talks about the concept of teach back, which really can be as simple as tell me in your own words, what are the two most important things that you need to do between this visit and the next visit? Or, you know, you can adapt them to your own situations. But that's just a little bit of an introduction. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Natalia. And some great tips there, tips from the experts. How lucky are we to have these three um, panellists with us tonight? And, you know, language is key and communication's key. Can we talk about respectful, you know, developing respectful relationships with our clients or patients or consumers, service users, however we want to, to use them, use terms. Um, I think Natalia's point was really important about language because mm. one of the things that happens when people are vulnerable or afraid their language uh, proficiency also is, is greatly affected. So I think that, that was just a really important yeah, and point. and that point with you, your own personal experience <laughs> with, you know, forgetting your English words when you were going through labour. So, yeah. And I also thought we've produced a, quite a great video on Teachback, so I might also give you the link for that one. Yeah, that'd that be great. That people can watch. Yeah, yeah, but no, great tips there. So I just want to say we did get our polls through eventually. We don't usually use polls in this format, so... Um, but they are there, and um, so 82% of our viewers said that they knew how to access an interpreter. Maybe the question is, do you know how to use that interpreter well? Yeah, yeah. so um, so that's great. So we've heard um, our introductions now, and we'd like to start getting into the nitty-gritty with some in-depth kind of discussions by looking at uh, case studies. So um, in our first case study, um, you'll see that on your screen. Um, and we've, we've set it in an antenatal setting, in a hospital setting. Natalia's working in a hospital setting. Ruth, educator and nurse, um, worked lots of experience in maternal health settings and maternity wards and um, maternal, maternal mental health. Mental health. Um, so we didn't give our, our, our woman any um, specific culture or too many details because we thought that that kind of gives you too much information and limits possibly our discussions about the case study. So I think also, you know, when this does happen in a health setting, um, you don't necessarily have all the information. So mm. this might be all the information you have. So mm. we, we thought we'd keep it real, didn't we? Because you were saying, Natalia, sometimes you don't get information. Someone comes into a hospital and there's 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 not a lot of information yes. there. So it's about how do we elicit that or yes. and not make assumptions. Exactly. And, or, you know, particularly looking at the antenatal setting, often the, you know, antenatal care is the first encounter a migrant woman mm. might have with the healthcare system. And that's really critical mm. when we need to stop and think again, you know, with this woman in our case study, we're saying she's come to an emergency department, 28 weeks pregnant, no antenatal care to date. And unfortunately, this is a reality for many women, especially our more recently arrived women. You know, first mm. child, very basic English. What I do think, we do? Yeah, mm. and I think, Natalia, you do? make a really important point because if it's your first encounter with the um, Australian health system, um, those experiences you receive at that time are going to shape your desire to engage or not engage with the health system. So I think it, it's a really significant kind of opportunity. Definitely. So if we, should we start to unpack and then see what details we can... We've said in this case an interpreter has been organised by the hospital. Um, Natalia, do you want to start by... We've talked about what the interpreter might... You, some of the skills the interpreter <laughs> so, might bring? So the, the important thing, I guess, to understand is that interpreter can only say what a health provider says. They're not allowed to embellish. They're not allowed to change it. So if you are speaking in a really complex clinical language, the interpreter is not allowed to change that register. So you actually need to focus on speaking in plain English and trying to engage with that woman. And again, one of my points was, you know, speak directly to the patient. <laughs> Very often we hear, oh, you know, can you please tell her A, B, C, D? You know. Instead of saying what I'd like to know from exactly. you. Exactly. You know, treat the person like any other, like you would an English speaking patient. Mm -hmm. You know, look <laughs> at them, talk to them. I know that it gets a little bit hard if you're not working with interpreters, you know, 
regularly, but you do get better as you practice more. Mm. So, you know, those are the points to note when interpreters engaged. Uh, the other thing I think that's important here is that we are not allowed to make any assumptions. You know, again, we have a woman that's 28 weeks pregnant presenting for the first time to anyone. No scans have been done. She's at that sort of end bit of maybe possibly squeezing in a glucose tolerance test for those of you that are, you know, more experienced in, in maternity services. You know, she's missed already a lot of critical care. And we know from research that, you know, the later a woman accesses antenatal care, the risk of things going wrong is greater. So, you know, how do we actually get migrant women to understand that how our services work, you know, that you have to go to a GP and get a referral that you can't just rock up to a hospital? Because in many countries, there's not an equivalent of a GP. You're lucky if you have a local community hospital. So, you know, again, we need to try and understand who that person in front of us is. What is their story? You know, what kind of a visa are they on? Are they Medicare eligible? Because that brings a whole lot of other issues. You know, if, if they don't have Medicare and have to pay for services. You know, in, in terms of, you know, other issues, again, I've mentioned before, you know, if we, if we decided not to have an interpreter there and if we use a family member to try and assist us, are we getting all of the information? There are actual real court cases of negligence simply because a bilingual person, not a professional interpreter, was used to consent people for surgery and things went wrong. And courts decide that both, you know, doctors and hospitals are negligent in that case. But very often on the call phase, being pressured for time, we don't think about this. Mm. Mm. Yeah, time is always crucial, isn't it? Um, and I'm just thinking, Ruth, if you were in this situation, in this scenario, what would be going through your head as this woman presents to you? Well, what, what I think was very interesting about this is that um, there are all kinds of different ways in which um, women, I shouldn't fiddle with my pen, um, <laughs> there are all kinds of different way, ways culturally in, in terms of um, the ways in which women are initiated into be becoming a mother. So I think um, in a way the antenatal hospital setting is a very technocratic kind of system. You know, Natalia, you've mentioned that, you know, there might be tests and, you know, all kinds of surveillance that might need to happen. But I think there's also a really beautiful opportunity at this point where we can find out what maternity means for the woman. You know, what, what does it mean to be pregnant? What kind of things are important to you um, while you're pregnant? What kind of things are going to be important to you after you have a baby? You know, like, um, and Queensland have done some really fantastic uh, resources which are in the blog, I think, blog link that I've given you, which has some terrific questions about the kinds of things you could ask somebody to get a sense of... Um, not just the important information you need to get from mm. her because she hasn't been seen. So much more but than what just her, the basic assessment yeah, questions. But what her priorities might be, what kind of supports, who might she want to have around her. Um, does she have anyone? Does she have anybody? <laughs> so, so I think it's a wonderful opportunity. And I think also the thing that's very important to, uh, about what the conversation we're having, and you alluded to cancer before, and I, I think is... There are transitions um, in the life of being a human being that are very significant. And in every culture, birth is something that has incredible significance. And the significance isn't just, um, uh, you know, biomedical. It's also sociological. It's cultural. It's about um, developing a whole new status. And, um, you know, I think this is a really important time where you could assess what kind of expectations the woman has mm. about what kind of support and help she might need or want. Mm. Um, it's also a very important time, as Natalia's already talked about, you know, in terms of health literacy. What about maternal health literacy? What is her understanding of her own body? Mm. What's her connection to the body? What are her concerns about being able to birth? What does she need for all of that? So I, I think... Um, you know, one of the things that's really, really important is that, um, you know, Natalia said that 
This is not an uncommon scenario. So there are women who don't know what they don't know. They might not know how the system works. And this is a very beautiful opportunity to actually establish a relationship. Um, uh, try and communicate trust, respect, um, kindness, generosity, um, holding somebody, letting them know that they're safe physically and mentally, socially, spiritually, all those things that are important um, so that you can do all the uh, important jobs um, that are part of being a health professional. Mm, so it's almost like it's more important to develop that rapport and that relationship and that trust first. It's going to make or break you... any future experiences. Mm. And so I think, you know, if the, we don't know at this stage whether she has other children, but we're kind of assuming because she's been disengaged that she might not. Mm. Um, so, you know, this experience is going to shape how her children receive care. You know, often, so often women are, take a lot of responsibility for mm. household health management. You know, I'm making a big generalization, but so, so I think we're in a position to really make a difference at this time. I think it's important to remember the, exactly that, that at each interaction we have the ability to make a difference, to affect change, to be that positive practitioner that maybe smiles, maybe it's as, as simple as that, smiling, as you said, touching, off being supportive, asking those right questions to really make somebody's on long-term experiences in the Australian healthcare system better. So Monique, did you have anything that, you know, in, t in terms of discussion, the case studies that yeah, thinking so about this woman? I, I don't work in, I haven't worked in that setting before, um, mm. but knowing, talking about some of the trainings that we've run um, with people who do work in those settings, we'll often hear from health services, um, they'll say, you know, we don't, we don't see women from certain migrant groups, we don't see refugee or immigrant women walking through our doors to access support services. Mm. Um, and one thing we often say there is, you know, they might not be walking through your door, but that doesn't mean that they don't exist. And we need to think about why it is that they're not coming to your service. Um, and I think in this case, thinking about why this woman might not have presented at an earlier stage um, and not just reducing that to, you know, her lack of English or her cultural traditions. Um, and so some of the things that I would be thinking about were, would be um, what are some of the systematic or structural barriers that this client might be facing at the moment? Um, and Natalia's brought up a few of those. Um, but things like visa categories, I often bring it up, but I think it's such an important thing mm -hmm. to think about. Um, women who are on certain visas, so international students, for example, or certain skilled visas, um, are often ineligible for Medicare and Centrelink. Um, and so they might be facing a lot of costs that they can't afford, um, especially around pregnancy. Um, overseas students are often required to maintain an overseas student health um, cover for the duration of their stay. But for example, that doesn't mean that they're covered for pregnancy in the first 12 months, um, which can have a huge impact on a woman. Um, and visa categories are things that are often changing. So um, mm -hmm. it's hard for us as health professionals to stay up to date on what's um, the latest. So I think for the people that it affects, it's, it's even harder because mm -hmm. they often don't have access to the same information that we have. Mm -hmm. um, so staying on top of that and being able to research that, that information, I think is really important. Um, I think limited understanding of how the system works is obviously a really big, um, a really big thing. Um, example that I was thinking of, we were working with, um, recently arrived Iranian community and in Iran um, most recently people don't see GPs, it's not part of their health system, they'll often go and visit specialists. So it was their experience that, you know, it's not part of their normal experience of pregnancy to go and see a GP. Um, so that's something that's new to them. So again, not assuming that they're familiar with the Western health system and that they would use GPs in the, in the same way or use hospital settings in the same way. Um, I think another really big one is lack of support networks and isolation, which um, we've touched on briefly. Um, but I think this can be language barriers, of course, that's something that's often brought up. But also I think um, the Australian immigration system can put a huge strain on families. Um, so what I noticed from this case study is that this woman was brought in by her neighbour. Um, and I wonder, you know, does she have family support? Does she have her family with her? Some people might be used to extended families supporting them in these situations. Um, the migration system doesn't always make it possible for people to migrate with their families. Um, 
and can often be incredibly violent and destructive for people who are trying to come here as refugees and asylum seekers um, or on temporary visas. Um, so this all leads to a lack of support and isolation. Um, and I think also distrust of the system. So we were talking about how, you know, if this is the first time that you have come into contact with the health system and you have a bad experience, um, it can change the way that you approach healthcare from then on. So it could be bad experiences of um, government or authority or health services in their country of origin. Um, or it could just be, you know, the refugee process. So if they were in detention, um, if they had bad experience with the, the Australian government, they might be unclear about what role um, the government authority is playing in this case um, and how much power and control they will have over the process. Um, so all of this distrust of the system might, you know, um, add to them not um, presenting at an earlier stage. Um, and just a last point of working with interpreters, just to support what Natalia said, um, that, you know, it's incredibly hard for the worker to work in that situation, um, but also for interpreters, um, talking to interpreters about trying to maintain the trust with both the, the client, um, so the person who needs the interpretation, and also um, the health practitioner. It's often a balancing act where, you know, they don't want to speak too long in one language and then not another because they're trying to balance that trust. Um, and as we've discussed, trust is one of the most important things to be building in your relationship with a client. So anything um, that can, you know, go against that can be very difficult um, for everyone involved in the situation. Wow, thanks, Monique. So many things to consider. And, you know, I mean, we're not even talking about icebergs again, <laughs> touching the tip of the iceberg with this one, but Ruth. Yeah, I just wanted to add one more thing, and, and uh, it was sparked off by listening to Monique, which is... Um, when I think about how people prepare for pregnancy, um, the kind of values we have around it in the, the Western world, for want of a better word, particularly Australia and New Zealand, which are my experience, it's kind of like there's an expectation that you'll read the books, that you'll go to antenatal classes, that you'll do this work. Um, but for many people, that kind of knowledge transmission happens in quite a different way um, in their countries of origin. It might be aunties, grandmothers, mothers, um, peers. And if you've migrated and, like Monique was saying, um, you've lost access to those people, who fulfills that role of knowledge transmission? So I think that's another really important kind of aspect. You know, how do you learn about your own body? What kind of knowledge do you have about your own body, um, about pregnancy, about menstruation, about all those other kinds of things? So that, that's something that you don't always <coughs> So does that become the, the you know, responsibility or, or the you know, role of the practitioner to find out about those things, to find out about the mothering experience in different cultures, to have some awareness of it? Or is that through well, well, discussion and dialogue and asking those questions or well, I think just this, being this, aware? I, I think it links back to something that um, you know, Monique said earlier, which is you can't possibly learn everything about everybody. And it's flawed mm. because... Um, you know, you gave a nice example, and I hope, uh, Natalia, you don't mind me referring to it, but, you know, you talked about when we, when we were preparing for this conversation about the difference between your mother and yourself. You know, so you might be from the same community, but express your cultural desires or needs or interpretations in quite different ways. They might have changed with your education, with your migration experience. So, you know, I, I don't think it's realistic or safe or appropriate necessarily for people to know about, you know, because then we're depending on stereotypes of groups that because we're assuming that people don't change or, mm. you know. But and it's not also on, on the, the client or the, the service user or patient to tell us all the time. Yeah, I, think I think we were having that discussion before as well that we have knowledge and we have access and we have we can go and find out things ourselves. It's not yeah. about knowing the answers but being informed taking an interest. I think, and I think you know, well, what I would emphasise more than curiosity is openness mm. and the desire to have a meaningful relationship with mm. someone where they feel cared for, mm -hmm. you know, where they feel cared for, um, they feel like they're in competent hands and the person wants to give them uh, a good health care mm. experience, for want of a better word. Patient experience is the buzzword at the moment. Mm. And so, you know, how do we do that? I think it's about, um, you know, demonstrating care and compassion 
Um, and I think when you've got that kind of foundation, the other things will come. Mm. But I, I don't know if uh, the other panelists agree with me. No, I, I do. And I guess one of the things talking about an example of, you know, antenatal education, or, we know, and, and the two maternity hospitals where I work, you know, we know that migrant women often do not attend antenatal classes. We actually did a project to engage with some of them and ask, you know, what is going on and what would you like? And what we ended up with is that a lot of them actually just want a simple old hospital tour. Show me when I'm in labor where I need to present mm. and show me, you know, who I need to see. You know, so in, women come from different systems again, and, you know, Monique touched on this with women from Iran, because for us in, in some parts of Melbourne, this is now becoming a, a significant new community for us. And one of the challenges we've had in one of our hospitals is that we were getting a significant number of women coming and demanding Caesars with no clinical indicators to, to need so. And once we've unpacked that and engaged with them and talked to them, in Iran, at the moment, there's a trend for women. It shows your social status if you can afford a Caesar. And so we had to do a whole lot of education and engaging with individual women to explain that, you know, here you will only have a Caesar if you really, really need it. <laughs> if there's a clinical reason for it, we're not doing it for fashion. So, you know, they are the things that unless you are in tune with who's in your service, you will miss out quickly. And, you know, if we are not willing to engage, and, you know, everything today, as Ruth just said, you know, consumer engagement, patient experience, all of those things we talk about, it is really important to, to pick up on those little things and try and see where that takes you when you actually speak to women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, and I was just going to, I was just looking back at some of our, our questions that we were asked for people that registered and um, although they were related to you know, maybe particular communities, they were asking about managing mental health stigma um, in perinatal mental health, um, particular interest in you know, working with Islamic communities um, around yeah, perinatal mental health, but also if there were any specific cultural or religious considerations to be aware of when you know, caring for a particular women during birthing. And so I think that we've you know, I think that while we're talking about antenatal and um, motherhood and, and parenting, you know, a little bit here, I think that's important to acknowledge that, um, you know, we've been able hopefully to address, you know, issues around broader groups. Um, but thank you to the, the people that, you know, put those questions in and I think it does fit into the, into the case study. And did anybody have anything that they, you know, wanted to to add to that before we move on to um, yeah. the next case study, yeah. Um, I think maybe a point about, you know, we, we can learn these things about particular communities and they can help us with our practice, um, but also that idea that Ruth said of being open. So if you know, for example, things about the Iranian community, a recently arrived Iranian community, you might know, you know, that they don't have um, GPs in Iran or they don't, you know, all of these things that come from, um, you know, your experience with the community, but to be able to hold that and then not assume that everyone who presents who is Iranian is going to be that. Um, and I think that that's true for these the questions about um, the Muslim community, any community. Um, you can go out there and you can educate yourself about what the, the major support needs are and the histories of that community um, and the histories in Australia. But at the same time, you have to be open to the diversity of experience within that community as well. So like I was saying, you know, there's as much diversity within as between. And just because you have two people who are presenting from the same community, mm -hmm. it really, it can say so many things about, you know, they could have such different experiences of their health and such different health needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And perinatal, the stigma of perinatal mental health is felt across cultures and differently within cultures as well. So, um, and I, ju I just wonder whether I could pick up on that because I, I, I also think that, um, there's a broader kind of societal discourse about what being a mother should be. And mm -hmm. it should be, you know, the treasures and um, huggies. I don't know. I'm out of touch with the best <laughs> nappy brands. But, you know, they, they always have beatific women looking content and 
like they've had plenty of sleep and the we know that. The joys of motherhood. The joys, you know, we'll there's a butterfly flying around. The best thing uh, you can ever do. So, so I think, you know, we, we've got a social stigma around not coping that I don't think um, we've addressed in any way adequately. And I think there are a whole lot of ways in which women are required to present themselves as mothers that... Um, you know, vary from, from different group, you know, you know, across groups. But I also think that um, perinatal mental health issues um, among communities have very different implications. And I think um, that sometimes um, mental health issues are seen as casting a stain, you know, stigma refers to a kind of stain, but, but one that has intergenerational kind of implications and it has... Uh, exclusions and inclusions that are very significant that you know we need to be mindful of so I think those labels and education um, are important just as they are in the broader population. Yeah, good points. So I think um, we might have to move on to the second case study and continue these conversations within this postnatal community setting um, so we've got a woman at her local community health centre. She's now got a two-week-old baby. Um, she's come to see the maternal child health nurse. It's her first, fourth child, um, but it's her first child that's been born in Australia. Um, we know that her partner is working long shift hours, but her mother-in-law has come over to support the family at this time. Um, when she meets with the maternal child health nurse, the woman is tearful and distressed about her birth experience, and the details unfold. -na -na -na. So how's this setting different? How's this woman's story potentially different? And what are some of the things that we'd want to be considering that we may not have already discussed? I'll just open it up to all, all of you to I'm just thinking into. I've seen a lot of women like this. Mm. So um, one of the things that I think um, health professionals often expect is that if a woman has had a baby before that she knows what to do and we've already talked about how difficult it is to navigate the health system how your expectations might be quite different from your country of origin and um, you know I, I'm kind of inclined to think of every new baby as a new baby and a new mother because the body's mm. different the experience might is different the context is different um, so I think that you know, this is a really interesting kind of scenario. Um, I, I think another important thing about this situation is how significant maternal figures are at this time for many communities. So um, it's very typical um, to have 40 days of rest. Um, and, you know, this is an acknowledgement that in order to nurture, the mother must be nurtured. And it's a very kind of different kind of perspective to that idea that a woman is ready to mother immediately when the baby is born. So um, in many, many countries and many cultures, there are rituals to support this transition uh, that ensure that the woman can rest after um, what might be seen as something quite traumatic. Um, it's been, you know, birth has been called uh, breaking your body into many bones, you know, in different cultures. And it's kind of that acknowledgement, not, not so much that it's traumatic, but it's a change in state that requires um, particular rituals that will return and maintain health. So if you shorten this process and you say, well, you've got to get out, you've got to get fresh air, sunshine, take the baby out, do this, do that, uh, you might be curtailing some things that are very culturally significant. So there are all kinds of things that, are, that can be put into place. And for many people, a mother or a mother-in-law is someone who can really help with a lot of the practical stuff. Um, so, you know, I think what this case study does is it challenges our ideas about who is the client, you know, mm -hmm. and points to the need for a very family-centered kind of approach. And I guess I was also thinking about how partners often become a stand-in for all the other support people that might have been there in the country of origin. So would you be wanting to work <coughs> or find out more about this woman's family or the yeah, mothering, the mother-in-law in? Def definitely, but also what kind of rituals might be important mm -hmm. or what mm -hmm. kind of supports. Or, uh, and, and often these, these things take the shape of particular diets or 
things that people should and shouldn't eat, mm. uh, around bathing, around going outside, around, um, yeah. Hot and cold and temperatures. <coughs> All and, kinds of things. Yeah. Um, and when and where you do things. And, and I think that sometimes these challenge the dominant ideas of maternity, which are uh, birth as a normal event, you know, and, and in a way it's kind of the other side of the caesarean story that we've just had. Um, birth as, the framing of birth as a normal event has been very, very empowering for women because what it's meant is that um, they can trust their bodies, you know, um, but the other side of that is also a pressure to return to normal duties, which can also be really tough, especially if you're sleep deprived. So I, I think, you know, establishing what are the things that are important to the person mm -hmm. is really important. Yeah, that's fantastic. But I think also thinking about the system again and, and where the woman is now, and again, Ruth mentioned this in terms of, you know, yes, it's her fourth, fourth child, but, you know, it's still number one in many respects, including here. And, you know, in, in our system, you know, we keeping women and women shorter and shorter in mm -hmm. hospitals. We expect them when they get home, at least in Victoria, you know, within a few days, you need to go out and visit a maternal and child health nurse and bring that baby in. You know, we, we have, I, I know some of our domiciliary midwives, when they go and see migrant women who might have a mother or a mother-in-law there, the constant conversations around, you know, oh, they're smothering those babies in covers and beanies and everything. You know, what about the risks of seeds? Again, you know, as Ruth said, we're not stopping to think, why are they doing this? Why is the baby dressed in a way it is? You know, have we asked the question? You know, have we tried to engage with the mother as well, not just, you know, the, the mother, the grandma, not, not just the, the mum who's had a baby, talking about, you know, many cultures are collective cultures. We make decisions together. But in our Australian healthcare system, I, I hear many stories where, you know, oh, the husband was there and he was answering all the questions for the wife. Well, that's okay. In many cultures, that's okay. That's how things work. It does not immediately indicate domestic violence. Yes, in some cases it may, but it's not necessarily so. You know, I had both my mothers present in every maternal and child health visit <laughs> until my kids were about two years old because they wanted to see what was actually going on. Why are you going to that center all the time? Why do you have that book where they write everything? Who cares? Baby's healthy. You go to a doctor if they're not healthy. You know, again, no understanding of how things are done here and why. Monique, your take um, on the case study? Yeah, I guess I don't have much new to add on top of Ruth and Natalia, um, but just to, to kind of echo what Ruth was saying about how, you know, um, it's her fourth child, but every, every birth is going to be a new experience for her, um, and especially because this is the first time that, that she has um, given birth in Australia. Um, and what immediately stands out to me is that this is her fourth child and that her partner is working long shift hours. So she's caring for four children and that would have a huge impact on, you know, what kind of appointments she's going to be able to make and transport and all of these things. Um, and it's also the first time that she's being a mother to these children in this context. So thinking about, you know, her sexual and reproductive health needs in general. So not just about this new baby and her, um, but more generally her needs around... Um, her health, um, so finding out information on a range of different topics, whether that's contraception, um, it could be a wide range of things. Um, and so, you know, it's not simply about her and the baby um, having to look more collectively at it. Yeah, great. And Ruth, you wanted to say? Yeah, I just wanted to add, because we, we haven't talked about the last sentence on that case study, mm -hmm. um, but, but when we were planning this um, webinar, um, I was thinking very much of someone that I nursed um, who came to our maternal mental health service and she said to me that um, she was experiencing many sort of post-traumatic stress um, symptoms after the birth of her baby. She was feeling tearful, agitated, anxious. Um, she felt very nervous whenever she was anywhere near the hospital and, and, what tra and she started avoiding the hospital. 
But what transpired from this was that um, she had to have an emergency caesarean. Now, we know that trauma is in the eyes of the beholder. Um, so what one person sees as traumatic might not be. Um, and what is common to the experiences of being traumatized are feelings of powerlessness and loss of control. And during um, the process between when, when the health professionals decided that she would need a caesarean, she didn't feel like she was consulted and talked to, given explanations. She felt rushed, pressured, um, like no one was listening, very, very powerless. <coughs> so I think, you know, we, we can't discount how uh, an experience might make somebody feel. I'm going to cough again. No, it's all right. <coughs> we'll hand it over. Yeah, hand it over. <laughs> um, so I'm just thinking, you know, with with this woman in this case study, like what would be, <coughs> you know, what would be the ideal outcome? Like how do we know that she's, as a, as a practitioner, as a service, as a, as, a, as a health system, like how do we know that we've had, you know, a good outcome, I guess not only for ourselves as practitioners but obviously most importantly for her and even for some of those other you know structural considerations in terms of if we're talking about implementing you know policy changes or how, how do we how do we measure you know our responses and what what does a good outcome look like well again this is where cultural safety because becomes important because it's not so much what we decide is the outcome mm. but what's important to her yeah so you know, if in developing the relationship, because it always comes back to the relationship, um, hopefully at that time we identify what she thinks is, are important, you know. Mm. What, what does mm. she want to, you know, what would be a good outcome for her? What does she feel would be useful? Mm. And then we use all our wonderful networks, our knowledge of the system to try and engage those um, systems and supports for her uh, mm. in as much as she wants us to, but to support her to have as much autonomy as she's able to have or wants to have. Mm. Any other comments from you guys around? Just thinking about the, some of the work we're doing at the moment with uh, in, in the western suburbs of Melbourne with a group of refugee women from the current community from Burma and how creative we actually can be with uh, existing resources if we actually join forces mm. as services so our local maternity hospital has partnered with a local maternal and child health center and service with a by, with a small agency that actually provides bicultural workers family support workers so they run play groups in this same community because we have a huge cohort of women that are birthing in our hospital and then leaving us. So we've actually partnered together to deliver a, a group pregnancy care model basically in the community. It took us a good 18 months to get there, but we are doing this. Every agency is contributing the existing resources. We're not asking for grants. We're not, you know, saying it's a one-off project. We are committed to making a difference because we know research has shown time and time again that refugee women have worse maternal outcomes than an average mainstream woman. And when you have a significant cohort of them accessing your service, you need to be creative. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, we, we're currently actually doing research to try and validate this particular model of care because it's, it's quite unique in terms of that partnership between the agencies to try and see, you know, but the feedback from women over the last 12 months has been extremely positive because for them it's that seamless transition from antenatal care, postnatal into the, you know, maternal and child health service and then play groups for their kids. So, you know, just one example. I know it's one small community, but it's a step. And I, I think, Natalia, um, what your point leads to <coughs> that I think is really important is that when we think about cultural safety, um, you know, we're not saying um, you have to do something massive, huge, time, time or resource intensive. It's, it's, it's mm. more being mindful of what can you do, but perhaps in a different way, mm. um, you know. And I, I kind of think that sometimes people are also very afraid of doing the wrong thing. Mm. 
and so they don't do anything yeah. you know because Definitely. of that fear of like am i going to cause offense am i going to put my foot in it well mm. i just won't do anything and then that way i can't get it wrong so i think when we're talking about um the issue of culture i think it's just really important to say that um how we learn is through engagement it's not by avoiding people um it's about noticing the gaps and silences as monique talked about you know who is not coming to the door? Who's going right past it? Um, and then what can we do differently or how can we, um, you know, think about what we're offering and whether there are other things we could offer? And that there's no tick boxes to these questions or situations mm. and small pilot projects of research and being creative, talking to your, your team, you know, you know, attending webinars like this, reflecting on our own I think it's a, it's a big point about, you know, what we've learnt and heard tonight is reflecting on our own role in, in the system, in the service, and with our own background and with our own culture. Um, and I think, you know, if, if people from tonight can walk away with, you know, some of these ideas, and they may be very small. Um, as we said, you know, cultural safety has been around for a long time now. It's not, not a new concept, but, you know, the idea of having it as core business um, we're still advocating for that one. Um, so anyone else want to dive in at this point or? Well, we've had a couple of other questions that I think, um, you know, would, would, would be good to, to talk to. I mean, I know we've talked a little bit about this and then, you know, how do you do all these goals in short space of time when you've got limited resources? You've got a consultation, so, you know, we'd say you're a GP, you've got a consultation for 10 minutes. Um, if we think about, all right, you're not going to be able to, to, to do everything and be every, everything in that situation. What are some of the, what are some of the things that we can achieve um, that don't maybe take a whole lot of time? Is it, is it things like, you know, signs? On our on our workplace, is it having different resources? If it's having the TIS number available, like what are some of the? I think it's also again about educating people, and and again, you know, apologies for another personal story, but my mother-in-law recently visited a new GP, and she basically got well. I can't see you with five issues at once. You need to come again. Nobody ever has explained to her how, you know, that the time is limited, that maybe if she has complex issues that she needs to request a longer appointment. You know, again, we make assumptions that people know this. You know, so she was really offended. She came home and said, I'm not going back there ever again, you know. 70 plus year old woman with multiple health issues and chronic illnesses and we're all going, oh my God, you know, what do we do now? But, you know, so I sort of, you know, set her down and explained that, you know, really the GP has the 10 minutes. He can't look at your five issues. You need to focus it. You need to maybe go a little bit more often. You know, it doesn't cost you anything. All of these things. But again, you know, th there was no education in that encounter. All she got was a cold, you can't come with that many issues at once. No education. No education on behalf of that GP to maybe say, you know, look, my time is limited. You know, what's the I'm priority at the moment, you know, and can we maybe schedule a visit next week or mm. something like that? Mm. Or maybe the receptionist, you know, at the point of making that appointment, you know, could mm. be asking, what are you, what yeah. are you coming what is in the for? Issue? Is, is it a normal 10-minute consultation what you're looking for? Will that mm. be enough? That's interesting because my GP does has that automatically, you know, mm. pick your appointment length. Complex mm. issues, simple issues. So I, I think that's it's so variable, mm. the kind of context in which we work. Yeah. Mm. Sure. So I, I, I wanted to pick up on something Natalia said, which is it's about working smarter. You know, like you, you just talked about organisations really thinking about how they cooperate better. Mm. And I think those are just some of the simple things about how care is organised that mm. we can do. Mm. And I think also, you know, um, we talk a lot about what we can do on the personal level. So that kind of brings it down to one person is responsible for doing that. And I think, like, we have to prepare for the fact that that person might leave the organisation and then how do we ensure that the organisation keeps going with that practice? 
Um, and I think that happens when you put it into policy on the organisational level mm -hmm. um, and also when you advocate on the structural level around how much funding you need for certain things um, and how much time is needed for certain services. Um, and those things don't change overnight and they, don't, they often require more than one person advocating. Um, but I think you can really make a difference um, if you're passionate about it. Um, but things like interpreters are really good examples to use, that it's not just left up to the individual to say, you know, I think it's worth getting an interpreter, but that you have it in your policy to make sure that all clients know that it's a service that's offered, that it's free, and what languages it's available in. And that might be um, putting it into your policy so that receptionists have to um, offer that information up, or it could be, as you were saying, like signs up around the office in different languages so that people know that stuff. So it's not just left up to one person within the organisation to know Mm. Oh, to be culturally competent, we have to do this, this, It's and not this. like the fire warden, you know, yeah. we all get the fire warden <laughs> hat or the cultural safety hat. Yeah. It's everybody's responsibility. Right. Yeah, mm. and to have those discussions with your colleagues, um, to have those reminders, you know, also to yourself but to the organisation as well that, you know, you know, was I culturally safe today or something, mm. you know, some little note to yourself, just a little reminder, you know, like have I... How have my engagements been um, mm. with the people that I've uh, that I've seen today? So, um, no, there's some good ideas there. Ones that um, people can implement, I hope, fairly easily, um, in, you know, in a practice setting. So, um, some other questions that we had, which um, were around cultural beliefs around screening for well women, um, and how can we address <coughs> some of those. Um, and also around different cultures viewing things like pap smears, which relates to the to the screening kind of question, mammograms, and um, I think um, Natalia, did you want to? I thought you were going to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, that's fine. <laughs> Probably between us all, we have plenty to say. But uh, I think again, you know, concepts that may not be familiar, you know, and and in in our preparation for this, Ruth was actually talking about. You know, for some women in some cultures, doing screening when you're healthy, you may actually, there, there could be a belief that you're bringing things onto yourself, that you're sort of, you know, playing with fate and, you know, cancer might come just because you're trying to screen it, you know. And, and instead of just having, again, our blatant, you know, conclusion, or, you know, migrant women don't screen, they don't attend here, they don't attend there, or, you know, we have a non-compliant patient, and I hate that expression personally but you know it's it's around again how do we understand what the beliefs and systems around screening are and and how do we then engage and unpack that and and get those messages there and you know and sometimes it is that balance between is us pushing a certain point going to do more harm potentially than good Mm -hmm. And I think those are really important things to think about with every individual case. But mm -hmm. I don't know, Ruth, I, don't know. I just might go to a question that we've yeah. just had come in um, from the audience. Um, so uh, it's mid I'm a midwife in a rural town in northern Queensland. We have a small community of women who are from a small North Asian country. We have been unable to access an interpreter service where the actual language is spoken. The closest we've been able to get is a Russian-speaking interpreter where Russian is the woman's second language. The husbands are often required to interpret. Any suggestions as to how we could improve our service? So, so, so I'm not just clear from that whether that's access to just an on-site interpreter or a phone interpreter, and I guess that's the tricky mm. thing. Uh, there are some situations where we do have specific instances of, you know, very rare dialects and, you know, situations where we don't have another choice but to use a family member uh, to, to assist with communication. But, you know, generally, majority of languages can be covered through the telephone interpreting service. We have had instances of, you know, sending healthcare workers from particular communities to, you know, short language courses to be language aids, not full-blown interpreters. So, you know, again, I'm, I'm not really familiar with, with the system, but, you know, if, if there is a, a 
a local community, whether there are people in there that could become, you know, someone that could access a bit of training and, and, and become a bit of that mm. bridge as well, maybe another option when, if there is no actual interpreter available anyway. Mm. I also know that, uh, you know, there's a couple of hospitals in Melbourne that have actually accessed services from overseas in, in very extreme situations and cases and the joy of, you know, Google these days. I'm not saying use Google Translate. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a very terrible tool when it comes to health. But, you know, whether it's about searching, you know, for, for information online, whether there are people somewhere in the world who can do this. There you go. Online, live, <laughs> expert help um, from Melbourne to, to, to rural Queensland. So thanks for, for sending us that, um, that question. Um, I'm just conscious that we've only got a few more minutes to go and I would like the opportunity to um, give each of you, uh, you know, some final summations of, you know, what we've discussed today and some particularly, I think we've given a lot of practical advice, hopefully, and some good theoretical understandings, but if there was anything um, that you'd like to leave our viewers with. Or are you going to do a poll as well? Well, should we try the last one? Should we try? Yeah, why don't, why don't we do that? All we right, so we'll later. push through the last poll. <laughs> uh, clo closing comments. And, um, and then while you reflect on, clo where, while, we, well, while we do the closing comments, let's ask, um, so it should be up on your screen now. Um, and we'd love to know how useful this webinar has been in providing you with some ideas and some strategies to help you in your work um, when, with women from multicultural, multi-faith backgrounds. So... Um, thanks for tuning in. Um, thanks for staying with us. And if you're still there, please complete that poll. And it's come through already. So there you go. 76%. Um, very useful. So well done, everybody. Um, and 24% have been somewhat useful. So nobody thought it wasn't useful at all. Um, so <laughs> what a relief. That, that's a relief. Um, so I've got a couple of things to, to, to tie off very quickly. So just very quickly, you know, one... one. I've, I've got one point really, and it links up with something Natalia said. Um, not only is it important, I think, to have relationships with our clients and their families, I also think it's important to have relationships with other services. Mm -hmm. So you might not necessarily have all the skills that you need to provide comprehensive health care to someone that's going to be safe and appropriate. So having good relationships and having a good idea about your community and who else might be there that can provide the help that you need. Yeah. Um, I guess I'd like to come back to my, my points about culture because I think I can't say this enough, but this idea that culture is very political um, and that health outcomes, they're the result of a whole range of, of complex reasons, which and we have to look at the social, um, sociocultural context in which women live their lives, so where they work, live and socialise. I think trying to solve these disparities just through cultural competency training um, by the idea of collapsing all of these different factors into just being about traditional cultural backgrounds means that we miss out on some of the really important issues like racism and sexism, discrimination, poverty, the allocation of resources, um, and we collapse it into this less threatening idea of culture. Um, so I guess I want to leave us with a message of to think about culture on that political level, so to think about those structural and social impacts. Yeah, and, on and politics means the allocation of resources. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's a great point. Thank you. <coughs> and for me, it's really a simple try and think who that person in front of you is. Don't put us all in the same basket, please. Mm -hmm. I think my colleagues have had said the rest. <laughs> well, I'd just like to end the webinar here and just thank the three of you so much for joining us. It's a slightly different, you know, topic for us at Jean Howes and I think we've had wonderful discussions and Thank you to all of you that have tuned in and joined us. Um, we're going to end tonight, but the recorded version, if you want to watch us all again, will be up and available next week, along with all the resources. Please um, don't forget to fill in the evaluations. We love to, we'd love to know what you think or topics for, for future webinars in our series. Um, thanks for joining us um, on your Tuesday night. And um, thank you again to our panellists. It's been a really great discussion. Thank you so much. Good night.